Okay, so uh, good. Um, we have a couple more weeks before spring break. The idea was to have project presentations next week, but I think that's probably insane. So maybe we'll do that after spring break. And I, I want to give you more ideas of things to work on as well. So uh, to improve the possibilities and some more explicit projects that I'd like to see done. Um, all right, so I, so I gave a talk, as you know, uh, at the Media Lab last week. And my, uh, where I used to work is, is in the, I was in math, but I escaped to the green building, which is, let me get this to work. The green building is this thing. If you've ever seen MIT, or gone, probably, preferably from, not at MIT, but from, away from MIT. If you look across from Boston, there's this building sticking up. It's the green building, it's building 54, little bubble on top. It's the tallest thing yet. So it's built by, it's iron pay. It's a terrible building, right? So when, of course, when they first made it, the windows started to pop out. I think that happened to the Hancock building over in Boston as well, so they had to fix all that. But also, it's just these thin little corridors, and there's no interaction. It's a disaster. And they all look the same. It's you know, in the great tradition of MIT being very young. Uh, institutional, right? Comfy chairs at Harvard, and uh, <laughs> just nothing. Because we just there with your brain. Anyway, it's sitting there. So there's been this, there's been this uh, great desire. I thought it had been done in some way before. So there's been this great desire to put. Uh, so hacking comes from MIT, right? So the idea of a hack is originally not a bad thing. It's supposed to be a practical joke, and, and the rule is that you have to be able to remove everything. Right? So you know there are famous hacks of one morning everyone woke up and there was a police car sitting on top of a big dome with a mannequin police officer inside it and donuts and everything and it was flashing and so on and they built it in the middle of the night. One, one day actually I was running on the other side of the river and I looked across and I don't know how I didn't notice but uh, the dome had been turned into Artu Dito for, um, <laughs> for the new uh, series of Star Wars uh, which was a little up. But anyway, um, anyway, so this is a ridiculous building. The thing was, the, the great, the great, so the, the holy grail of hacks was to play Tetris on this. You set it up to play Tetris on it. And so they did it. So my advisor, we used to have to be down here on the sixth floor. He's now ascended to the 18th floor uh, and has a pretty good situation. Here. So let me show you. So these are the views. Very nice views. So this is a disaster that happened because of um, Frank Gehry. <laughs> it's actually all, some of it did fall down, but this is actually on purpose. Anyway, so. Um, and there, there are rooms in there you know, so it's a seminar room, you can sit in there, you literally feel, you start to feel sick within minutes. You just want to, it's a bit tilted. Anyway, so it's some sort of psychological torture thing. <laughs> this is a view from the other side. Okay, so you look out these windows and there are these horrible windows. So, so one morning, my, so my advisor, Dan Rothman, um, who's a geophysicist, kind of does a lot of different things. But, so one morning he walks in and there's this little piece, and I'll show you a little further away from it. What you see in here is this Project Tetris. So they come in the night, and all of these windows, they actually physically stuck these things down, which was a bit naughty. But they did it on September 10th, and then the next day, they put up an American flag on the, on the you know, so they showed that. <laughs> that must be Josh Bongard's robot. Is it? You know, is that what's happening? Is it, are we done? Is it, yeah. It's getting close that time. Um, he says I'm on a list that says we can survive. But anyway. Um, Okay, so these things are stuck here. There's a little heat sink around them. They're plugged in. It's kind of an opt-out switch if you don't want to be part of a game. If you, you can leave your light on. And so that's it. So that was pretty good. Anyway, so they set it up, and, and you can actually physically play Tetris from a distance. Um, and I think, I don't know who gets to do this, but uh, hopefully it's not an ad. It'll be an ad. Come on. <laughs> And skip that. All right. So there's a little bit, so it's going on, right? It has colors. <laughs> so some people are still there working, so there's some lights on. And so you can actually, so people are playing. There's a little, there's a little, you can play from a distance. So they're done. That's the end of, I'll show you where I, okay, yeah. So here, I think. Right, so right, so they failed, and that's the end of the game. It's gonna have Tetris run across. <laughs> yeah, so this is a 20 story building. Oh, cool. Um, these people will probably never graduate. But, uh, they did it anyway. So that was fun. As I said, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, "What's that thing?" And it's like, "Ah, well." <laughs> anyway, so no one took it down. Tetris. 
Pretty great. Um, okay, so I'll show you one other thing. So, all right, so we we had, we put up a we had a fun blog post. I've been I told you a little bit about this hacking stuff that we had the other day, and that's what I was talking about. Um, the Media Lab uh, also gunned on Friday, which is nice. And so we had a blog post come out, and here it is. So it's where is the happy city in the USA? So it's you know, right from the US. So. So some excitement about that because, of course, everyone wants to know what the worst one is and the, and the happiest and saddest one. So Napa comes up as the happiest, right? <laughs> and of course, people are talking about wine and restaurants and so on, but they're also swearing a lot less. And there's a whole, you know, there's a texture of what's coming out of it. And it is, you know, this is the voice of Twitter coming out of it. It doesn't mean that you sample everyone that that's going to be the same way. That's the map of the U.S., right? So. Utah, pretty good. Nevada, you know, pr presumably there's some lies coming out of here, especially in Nevada, obviously. Maine is doing quite well, so I'm not sure about that. Um, but Mississippi and Louisiana, not so good. And that sort of matches up with uh, some, of the, some of the stuff about uh, those states in terms of general things. All right, so then we get these comments. So it was Beaumont, Texas, is the loss. So they've erupted. And so you get these comments like, I live in Beaumont and I post a lot of unhappy words, mostly related to a corrupt and dysfunctional school district. So we've got, that's, that's what, and I think this is right on target. This is, there's a couple of good ones down here. Um, uh, where is it? This one. So Redneck, Redneck with a few extra letters posted this. I've lived in quite a few places. Beaumont, it's a pure hellhole. <laughs> <laughs> human trashy, terrible schools, crime, lots of crime. No public parks or activities, terrible culture. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the crawfish. Anyway, um, so then there's a, and there's a hellish experience for me, blah, 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 they go on about it. So there's a post right at the end that we just noticed. It's like, I've lived there and I love it. So there's a little bit of, a little bit of fight back. <laughs> So, so is, there, is there a way to make that more, I just feel like a lot of the, so if you're talking about Napa or Nevada, you've got a lot of places where there's a lot of tourism. Is there a way to normalize it for tourism to actually try to look at so you, residents? I think you can, so Twitter's a, you know, this is just Twitter, and of right. we've got lots of things. I think one thing you can do with Twitter, and the way to do it is you can, with people geotagging, is you can see where the people who are moving around. Okay. So you can differentiate the tours. I mean, it's a little, getting a little big brotherish, right, but right, right. You, can do it, you can do it on a, you can do it fairly well where you just say, okay, this person is clearly... Right. Because there is a zip, zip distribution for where people move around to, right? And so you can tell when they travel. And we don't want to look at any one person, but you could do it. You can, you know, and definitely for places like Nevada, for um, uh, you know, New York City, you know, you can see. So there's some nice work with uh, Flickr, I think, where people are able to actually differentiate between the people who live in New York City and the people who travel there and the photos they take. It's a different set of photos, which makes sense. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, right? Um, all right, so that's taken off, and we've got a lot of, I don't know, let's see, what is it now? Um, there you go, 15,000 views. Oh, it's good, it's good. So people are unhappy and happy about that story. Uh, got them excited. All right, so I think we're done with the uh, extra bits and stuff. Um, Yes, so we, the, we have a Department of Truth uh, associated with the, the course now, which means grading. So um, the uh, unofficial grader, uh, well, will not be named, right, um, is, is processing uh, your assignments. They should come back on Thursday, actually. So, all right, and we have a assignment for you on Thursday, and we'll have some new ones coming out as well. All right, so we have a little bit of a hiccup with being away, but. Good. All right. So the next few weeks, and this will connect into material that we have coming up later on, contagion and spreading, that sort of stuff, which is such a huge part of uh, system dynamics, uh, is networks, right? So we're going to talk about networks. So I'll probably repeat myself, but this is a, you know, I, I came through graduate school just at the time that this was really taking off, towards the end of it, of my time. And I, I worked on river networks, so I accidentally was working on big data problems and and network problems, branching networks, which is quite beautiful um, and physical and real and important and enormous. But uh, there's, there's, you know, it's just a huge vista of network stories that, that have emerged. We'll see how it ties into the Simon story uh, in some, some instances. Uh, I've already mentioned that a little bit, but we'll see how that connects. Um, 
And uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a little, you know, some very basic definitions, a little bit of history of this, uh, and some, you know, very prime, prime kind of examples. I want to break it into you know, maybe roughly three kinds of networks. Uh, very simple property story here, things that people have measured. So there'll be a, in here I'll kind of explain why graph theory hadn't figured all of this out, right? So why it's, you know, why we have this field of complex networks now. Uh, and then we'll get into some basic models. So these are the most important ones, and I'm going to probably change these slides a little bit to, to blow some of these up or, or shrink some of them. But so-called generalized random networks, pure random networks have been a mathematical joy for a long time. Ed Ish worked on that sort of stuff, a lot of other people. There's a lot of good math in there, but it turns out you never ever see them in the real world, ever, right? <laughs> but you do see generalized random you, you can see something that uh, is, is in this field. So, so that's okay. Um, it doesn't have a generative story necessarily, for a simple one perhaps, right? So what's the mechanism for building these networks? And that's where we move away from, say, graph theory. Scale-free networks is the big mechanism story, and that's again, the rich gets richer. That's Simon's, I mean, this is all disconnected, but, but now we understand it is all part of a big picture. Small world networks, so this is stuff that I was involved in uh, very deeply. Uh, this is that Strogatz character, again, and a fellow called Duncan Watts that I work with at Columbia for many years. So, there's that, and then that's connected to this generalized affiliation network. So these are things I want to highlight. There's a lot more you can do. Uh, the generalized random networks uh, opens up this sort of whole world of, of uh, math that you can do to uh, get some real uh, analytical insights. Right? Pretty clean stuff, uh, and, and that's, that's an important thing. Right? So there's lots of stuff we can't really do analytically. We can describe it maybe. Um, but we might not have a really nice mechanism for how it comes about. But we need those really simple models. We've talked about this a lot. Those toy models where we can see everything. You know, what's the mechanism? What are the ingredients? And we can see the, the macro behavior that comes out. Uh, and then when we go to real problems, which are usually going to be much messier, we, we, have a, you know, we have these really strong handles that we can at least frame things with. All right, so networks. All right, so this is just... It's an old word, and I just wanted to trace through the uh, history of it. It's always not a beautiful word, but... Um, so there's a history of it going from roads um, uh, to railroads to, and then sort of lifting out to information. Right? So this is a network of people we're talking about here, a group of people exchanging information. Uh, then we get to computers and machines and operations. So you see this kind of lifting of this metaphor. It's very physical to start with uh, in time. It's really over the last few hundred years. Uh, and of course, there's the verb to network as well. All right, uh, lots of good words in here. So <laughs> particular will be a word that we'll, I'll, I'll mention again, but web, of course, is the word that we use. We, you know, we, it's not the worldwide network, it's the worldwide web. We like alliteration, but there are some nice words in here. Matrix, of course, makes for a good movie. Maze, labyrinth, warranty, it's good, good, delicious words, all right? Um, all right, so some history, so this is a, Funny connection for me. Keith Briggs was a, uh, I think he was a postdoctoral fellow at Melbourne Uni when I was sort of a proto-human running around, not knowing what I was doing. But I remember him trying to calculate Feigenbaum's constant to the largest number. <laughs> um, no, you know, so some people off with pi, getting a billion digits out of pi. But there's another one, Feig, right? There's all these constants. So Feigenbaum's number is, is another one. So if you've done calculus, you're in calculus. Feigenbaum's number is a Ridiculous number that appears there. All right, so opus reticulatum. So this is a network. So this is network, and so this is right. So a copy of a, kind of a web structure. So people are making things. So this is making. So well, I'll say this again, but it's like uh, like uh, you know ironwork or stonework. Right. So it's, that's the that's the story. Uh, so written down in terms of written down, thou shalt not make it to a great like network of brass. Right. So this is from the Bible. Um, the Geneva Bible, uh, people talking about things that so we have reticulate structures in animals, so of course the OED loves to lay out the history of things. Uh, rivers and canals is what I was saying before, so this is to do with biology, this is about um, the landscape, now we get to something more man-made, railways, of course canals are as well. Um, electrical cables, so we're lifting out into a stronger metaphor, and then wireless broadcasting networks, and of course now we have computer networks, and so on. Um, <coughs> And we talk about social networks. So in here, uh, the study of social networks eventually appears around the 30s, the 1930s, when people start to, I mean, we've known about social structures for a long time, of course, it's just, just there, but 
we start to formally study it back then. Uh, these are all words, there you go. So net is a spider web, spider web that goes back to 888. Um, and of course, work meaning postal action. So there's some fun there if you want to look at that, but that's the history of these things. Uh, so based on a web, very nice. Right. Good, good. Uh, so they're all words stuck together. Okay, so the big deal, so many, so, so I'm talking about, so the Santa Fe Institute came to being in the, I think it was the 80s, maybe the late, late 70s, but uh, this, this trumpeting of this idea of uh, looking at complexity, by right, trying to solve these problems. We've had this, I've talked about this amazing period where we've been able to figure out the, the small pieces to, you know, to show to ourselves in the very first place that there are atoms and we can count them, we can elucidate them. Uh, of course, we get the DNA and genes and all those sorts of things. Uh, and this is, this is understood, if you go back in the literature, but uh, well understood, but it, it's, it's really, it doesn't, it doesn't really take off until the late 90s where people start to see all these complex systems as networks, right? So just, um, there's usually some uh, interaction pattern which is sparse, right? So fairly thin, um, very different to say, uh, I mean, okay. Um, but this idea that if we, if we translate this, this structure into a network, we can really tackle that thing. Right? And that's what this is, so we, we can look at it mathematically um, through analysis. We can, of course, start to do all sorts of computer simulations. Uh, and there are these two things that have happened with, with computers. One is simulation, one is simply recording data and being able to describe things. Right? So, very powerful. Uh, and I think from so 1998 through, to, and, and it's still going, but there's been this incredibly strong um, push from people in physics. So the stat map, I talked about the Ising model, just you know, give you a little bit. These, these characters who are good at thinking about small pieces are being combined with you. Big stories, uh, going from everything from magnets to gases and so on, uh, have had a field day. They've had a field day. They're really good at producing analytically some huge sort of set of networks and then spreading things on them or trying to fraction them in some way and seeing how they work. Um, and it's an insane amount of, uh, it, it, it pretty quickly got to be too much. There's no way you can read all of this, right? So this just ballooned into a, to a monstrous thing. So early on there was a lot of uh, low hanging fruit and people were getting published in, in great ways uh, in science and nature and so on. So it's toughened up a little bit. Um, but it's, it's very much the reality of this. So this is here's your typical theoretical physicist. Um, I mean, they're, they're kind of insane, right? So uh, they hunt in packs, and they tend to they tend to do this. They tend to uh, jump on a new field and just devour it, right? Rip it to pieces. So it's a bit like little kids playing soccer, where right? the ball pops out and they go Look, jump, and then it pops out and go. So um, so they've had they've had an absolute field. The computer scientists have come in and started to add an enormous amount as well. Uh, and and that, that's just going to keep going. So the, the tricky bit that you get with computer science is the, the black box story. You're not, right, from a science point of view, you can do, you have superpowers, you can do amazing things. Um, but sometimes it's hard to uh, explain them, right? So, and maybe that's it. We've talked about that. Maybe there are just limits to what we can do. All right. Okay, so this is actually, so that's, I, I should update that. So let me update that. And I had an idea that I could look this up on Google Scholar. So this is this is actually from Web of Science. Uh, for some reason those links up work a bit. Uh, so these are much more. I'm going to find this on Google Scholar right now because this is fun. So this, these are the two papers I want to talk about. I'll talk about this one first, and then Watson Strogatz. Um, so this is great, great title: Collective Dynamics of Small World Networks. So this will con connect back to an experiment by Stanley Milgram. Uh, but that was a great framing, really changed the way people thought about things. So there's data involved in here, right? So there's the uh, power grid for the US or the Western uh, states, I think. Uh, there's a C. elegans neural network, which is only about 290 neurons, but that's in there as well. And there's the so-called actigraph, where you somewhat ridiculously take every movie uh, and you take every character and uh, every actor in the movie and uh, uh, say that they're connected to each other, right? And then you build a network. So, and there's the Kevin Bacon game, right? Okay. So that's exactly, so six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So we'll talk about that. There is actually, 
Um, so in math, for a long time, there's been this addish number story, right? So you count. So it's the same idea, except instead of movies, it's papers. Not quite as exciting. So if you co-author a paper with someone, then you are you're linked to them. You're one step away. Uh, and then, of course, you could put anyone at the center of this and think about how people are connected to them. But addish is a is a great uh, monster of mathematics. And so, uh, so you count how far away you are from from him. So um, then there's the addish. Uh, uh, Eddish Bacon number, right? Or Bacon Eddish number. So you can look all these things up, people have listed. Um, and uh, so you have to have been in a movie as well, right? So <laughs> oh God, I'm going to look this up because it's quite fun. Um, and in fact, we have one of our students in our group, uh, I guess, I should read main name was, but she was in a uh, film in the Dominican Republic with. Isabella Wende and a few others. It's just kind of cast as the, the mistress of a, an evil dictator. And, <laughs> and so she does a genuine part. Um, and uh, so she has a finite, a finite uh, bacon edge. Right? So Natalie Portman has one too. <laughs> kind of ridiculous. So we'll talk about this. So here's a list of them. Yeah, Natalie Portman's in there. So, so you add up the two numbers, right? So, um, it's kind of ridiculous, right? So she was in a film with Bacon, so she does well there. Strogatz has one of four. We had a little thing on Twitter the other day where he was talking about how he might have a lowest one, um, <laughs> but actually, it's uh, <clears throat> it might be three. I think. It depends how you frame these things, but uh, those. Um, it's a, so there's a professor at MIT who helped with goodwill hunting, who's an extra in goodwill hunting. So if you give him a, if you give, and then there's some, I think it's Mini Driver was in a, in that film, and then one with Kevin Bacon. So you give him a two there, and then he co-wrote five or six papers with Ed. So he, <laughs> he gets a three. Uh, so it's somewhat ridiculous, but we actually have it mixed a, a finite Bacon, Edish Bacon. All right, so that's a bit of a detour for you. Um, I, would, I do want to find this other thing as well, so scholar, yeah, okay, that's good. So let's say uh, collective dynamics, will that work? I think that should be. yeah, small world networks. Let's see, so this is a, Google Scholar is a more general thing. Uh, all right, well I'll have to find it in a better way. But I think it's something like 20,000. <coughs> Which is a lot. It's a lot. There you go. All right, so Duncan's here. All right, here it is. Um, so he's done pretty well. So this is, so here you go. So it's 18,000 for, and I guess these two are joined together. No, they're not actually. So 18,000 for this, and then 3,800 for a book, which is really his PhD thesis. Um, so that's solid. 18,000 is solid. That means you've started a new field. Uh, so, Let's go for variables. Yes. So here's the lead of it. So emergence of scaling random networks, 15,000 according to this. So, so these are real, these papers really matter. I'm not just telling you some stuff that I worked on and uh, was involved with tangentially or something. This is really huge. Uh, right. So it's not just the physicists. There are networks everywhere, right? So we and, and we've been able to start to describe them. So, right, these estimates are much more conservative. They're from uh, the Web of Science, which is a different thing. All right, there's a couple of review articles if you really want to dig into this. Is it, you know, they're more technical, but they're well, you know, they're well written for sure. There's, the earliest one is back in uh, um, this is maybe about 2001, I think. So this is Albert and Barabasi. It's the flip of the Raker Albert, if I was there, read that uh, first paper. Mark Newman, who's been a colossus in the networks uh, field, has a, uh, I'll fix up the citations. I'll, I'll hook them up to Google Scholar. So uh, this is you know, very well written. Uh, it's 2002. This one's more like 2006 or seven. Um, but these review articles are always, you know, when they're well done, they're, they're tremendous resources. Okay, so there's, Often better than a book, right? So often people write too much and think, why isn't this just a magazine article or something? But these are these are rich, well-structured things. Uh, 
Right. So there are some textbooks. There haven't been too many, but there are others. There's Mark Newman's, of course. Uh, he has one that appeared a few years ago. So you could look that up. Uh, and then John Kleinberg and Easley, do not know this fellow, but Kleinberg is a uh, MacArthur Genius Award fellow <coughs> at, uh, at Cornell. And they have been producing this uh, joint economics and uh, computer science course for a while. So, like that. Um, so you know, networks, crowds, and markets, and it's a bit of everything. Uh, so, there, there's, so again, I'm trying to tell you that it's a big deal. Uh, Popularity according to books. So this is still this is an enormous bestseller, uh, Gladwell. And we, we of course have work that says it's not all correct, but um, <laughs> um, this idea of the tipping point. So that's actually a shelling story, which we've mentioned. Uh, right. I'll come back to this later on. But this idea of the match being the key thing is a bit funny, right? So this is this is misidentifying why things take off. The, the suggestion, the strong suggestion, is that it's the match that matters, right? So it was forest fire. It's because of the match, and it's not because the, the more complicated, difficult view, especially for us as individuals, to take is that it's a it's a group story, a collective story. It's because the forest was dry and connected enough. You know, when you say it like that, it sounds like oh yeah, well fair enough. You know, if it was raining, it wouldn't matter how big your match was. Anyway, that's a, that's a bit of a funny framing, and this is all to do with influentials and why things take off. It's a great mystery of of uh, spreading, advertising, people. Want to know about it. of course we want to know about it from every point of view education and so on. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Mark Buchanan's written a lot of uh, popular science books that are you know they're scholarly kind of things. Uh, so there you go, boom, groundbreaking science of networks. Uh, so we had a couple from the scientists themselves. So Duncan wrote this book when I was uh, at uh, Columbia in the group we had, um, collective dynamics group. So yeah, very nicely done. It's uh, more about the small world stuff and, and lots of other pieces. Uh, Linked is all about the scale-free So this is from a few years ago now. Lots of other books. <laughs> I need to run my screen. Lots and lots of other books. So this uh, top one is from an economist. Uh, this is Fractal River Basin, so that's, of course, uh, Earth Sciences uh, from River Networks. Uh, this is a more mathematical piece. This is from a physicist. This is, uh, so Rama was a, a postdoc when I was at MIT. We are in the same group. Vespignani is a huge, huge character. He's now at Northeastern. He's um, physically he's a giant in the field um, so th these two together wrote a great paper that showed that these scale free networks which we'll come to are incredibly susceptible to spreading at least from a theoretical point of view right so if you start to spread something on these networks it takes off like crazy so uh, which is a big deal there are a lot of networks like that and if they really can if things can really move around on those networks in an easy way then it's pretty bad uh, this is very this is much more mathematical coming from a graph theory uh, point of view uh, this is from the social the social network, um, uh, tradi the traditional uh, realm of social networks. So these are from uh, sociologists. Okay, so that's their sort of central book, and then and then these are more companion type things. Um, okay, so lots, and there are many more we could add, and we've still got a lot of time to go as we sort these things out. But I think I think we're you know we're getting. There. All right, so networks aren't new, right? We need to say this graph theory has been around for a fair while. We always sort of point to Euler as being the one who started things off by wondering, uh, as Königsberg, how there was a number of bridges, maybe seven bridges, and was there a way of wandering around those bridges without crossing them both ways? Um, sorry. Um, it's not a robot, right? You, should, you can tell us. I really worry about Bongo. I really worry about there's a lot of work with Dark, but I've never done some. Uh, yeah, right. What could go wrong? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so so that was thinking, you know, just a simple kind of thought, right? Thinking about how you might move around and so on, and, and, and blossomed into this enormous field of graph theory. Uh, as I said, social networks started to be a, a field in the 30s. Um, and this is like a balloon. So, so. So why is there all this new research? And, and I've said this a number of times, but it's, it's the data, right? So data made the big, big transition. This is the late 90s. So of course, computers are well established. The web has been going for, you know, not so long, but the web is, is, is now part of, of uh, scientists' existence very much. And data has been put up. You can scrape it off and, and all sorts of things, right? That's a huge transition. And just from 10 years before, you were not scraping data off. Um, WPN. Magic command. Okay. 
Always good to have W get in your pocket. Um, there are others, but that's, that's one of my favorites. Uh, so, uh, so, so now we're in trouble, right? Because you can have beautiful theories up until this point, and now you actually have to look at reality. So that's that's always disappointing. Um, this is still a huge argument, I have to say, with uh, with uh, people in different fields, but. Um, this is what we're after as scientists, right? We really want to get to this. I will say that graph theory, being part of pure math, you're allowed to kind of think about everything. And I think that's partly what happened. As I said before, random network, pure random networks, you don't really find them in the real world, and, but you find them in your head. You find them very naturally in your head. But the universe doesn't produce them because they have to be made, right? There has to be a, uh, a becoming story. And physics is about becoming, and all the other fields are about becoming. Math is more about just what is you know and some of this there's this idea of, well I, I, I not know Edish had this idea of the that you simply you know this God has a book of all the theorems and you're just trying to find them, right you're just trying to uncover, open this book up and, and go through it um, uh, so and so you can you can and it's and, 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 well I mean we can create things great for a couple but there is from a, a reality point of view that only certain things get made right that are likely can, can be made so. And uh, you know the fact that we see them over and over again gives us an idea of universality, and that's why we actually can create a course on this, or, or books and stories and tell each other. So this is what we're after: mechanistic explanations. And I'll say, show you that if we have this rich gets richer story again. It's the, the core one for, for uh, networks. There are some others floating around, but that's again becomes the most potent one. Um, uh, yeah, the most essential one, I suppose. But then there are there are many, many other possibilities, right? So um, maybe string theory is for you, right? So if you want to be in a stay in physics and and, uh, and uh, have your theories untainted by uh, too much reality, there's still there's still some reality, but um, that's imposed upon you. You know, as you go to a larger scale, your theory has to give you gravity and complicated things like that. But uh, but uh, you're allowed to make up all this stuff, you know, ten dimensions, whatever. Strings. It's very Python-esque, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Anyway, maybe it's true, but there's a, kind of a nice story there. Is so far it seems that there are, there's certainly a, that, that it's 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 uh, fundamentally untestable. Which is right. You can prove that your theory is untestable. Okay. So, uh, but it's it's been very interesting if you look back through the history of sciences. There are these transitions to remote sensing type. Situations, to big data situations, right? Biology changed, and we you know, went away from talking about humors and um, I don't know phrenology and stuff, right? This, the things that were, we could get out on the palmistry, we could get on the outside, um, and you know it's a struggle. There's a lot to describe, and figure out, and say biology, but but that's a big transition. Astrophysics changes in 2000. Just before that, you have to go to a telescope. Afterwards. Still a good thing to do, but now we have these giant, giant arrays that are just pulling in massive amounts of data. And uh, the skill sets are different, and the kind of questions you ask can be different. You know, one of them is, what is in this picture? You know, that's, that's okay, right? Uh, so a little hard to, to move sometimes from those, from the uh, data scarce to data rich situations. It's a bit of a painful time. Uh, and it doesn't mean, you know, as soon as you get a lot of data, you're gonna explain everything because it's always going to be still partial, right? Like Twitter, for example, doesn't explain all of humanity. But um, there's sort of a fervor that that's true. And genes don't, right? Genes don't as well, right? We had this absurdity where uh, uh, we got to uh, saying, okay, we're going to have uh, the gene um, sorted out. And it'll take us 10 years. And then we'll know everything. Right? We'll be able to solve every... You can go back and see this. I guess it's maybe 2098, something like that. We're going to solve every. Uh, we're going to solve uh, every. You know, no one will be obese. No one will write all these things. I mean, you see these. The, 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 you know, the, these were the claims, but and of course there are some diseases that, are, that can be linked very clearly to a few genes or one gene. But uh, now we're in the world of well, there are 300 genes associated with this thing, and there are some proteins and they interact. And okay, so now we're going up again. Which is great. That's what we should do. But we just didn't need to uh, get too carried away. Oh, no. All right. I'm repeating myself. So, 
This is sort of the end limit that I've seen. This is kind of insane. So lots of data. We get a little excited. And so you can, you can link to this paper. <coughs> oh, it's a piece on, on why Chris Anderson. So the end of theory, right? That's it. We've just got all this data. So we don't need to have a story for it anymore. We just, you know, we can describe things, right? And so, and there's a related one is the unreasonable effectiveness of data. And that is, people do this over and over again. It's a play on, uh, it's, is it Eugene Wigner? Is that right? No. The unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and no. natural sciences. Oh, I was thinking of the unreasonable lightness of the interrogation. Oh, yeah, well, that's a much more majestic direction to take. But, um, and, uh, I don't think that. That would be nice to know the unbearable lightness of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah if that was really. But it's the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and the natural sciences, right? So it's a sort of philosophical piece of that. Why can we describe anything with that? Um, I'm pretty sure that's it. So, uh, and so this is these these people are connected to. I think these guys are Google guys, right? And so it's true for them, right? They make some massive lookup tables and update it and so on. And if you want to figure out, uh, you know, so if you're Walmart, you have I'll mention Walmart again. You have some enormous amount of data on who bought what and who, you know, and what the weather was like, what time of the year it was. Uh, you can start to anticipate, predict maybe. It's, a little strong, but you can anticipate the kind of things that will sell out in this circumstance, and then you can start adding more of it, and then it's a little self-reinforcing. So one story that came out from a few years ago was that, you know, maybe this is 2004 or five. so Walmart had a pet, at the time, just an ins they had the biggest data collection, I think, on, on customers. I'm not sure what Amazon has some, but a uh, petabyte of data was this huge amount, and seemed huge at the time. But they uh, realized, for example, that people bought Pop-Tarts, uh, before hurricanes arrived in Florida, so, so <laughs> you know you might think shovels or sandbags, or you know, right? You might think let us do, you know, provide more things that you would think would be useful, but um, turns out you know that, that, that was something. So of course they provide more pop tarts, and then as a customer you walk and see more pop tarts. I, mean, I guess I should get pop tarts. <laughs> see other people buying pop tarts because it's what we do, right? And, and, okay. Now I have pop tarts, I feel safe because it's everyone else has pop tarts. They're not very good at keeping water out. <laughs> Turns out to be disappointing. Um, and no electricity is bad. Okay. Of course this is not this is this is a little this is a little out it's just really strange. I don't, I don't know. We've got over, you know, we went over the top here. Um, but you know, terrific if you want that, for sure. Absolutely, that's useful. But uh, from a science point of view, we need to we need to explain things and we need to understand things and and that might be, it might be impossible in some rooms. I don't know. You know, the brain, right? So the brain is this great, so we have Obama just saying, let's spend uh, 10 years doing what we did for the gene for the brain, right? We're gonna figure out the dynamic kind of excitation pattern of the brain. And interestingly, this uh, just popped up straight away after the EU announces two flagship programs for the next 10 years, and so they're putting a billion euros into both of these. One of them is graphene, which is not very exciting. Um, I think to the public, <laughs> but graphene is a pretty you know, amazing thing, and we need to. I don't know that that one. It seems like well, we'll see. I, I think they'll they'll get it done. They'll, they'll have real you know, achievements in ten years. Uh, the other one is the brain, right? Because we're just going. Well, I think the main story is the model of the brain completely, and then we'll be able again solve disease problems and all sorts. Of brain is really really hard, and so I don't think that's going to happen. We'll get somewhere. Uh, but I think the, the, so the US just popped up and said, oh, we're doing the brain too, and here is three times as much money. So <laughs> kind of a funny little uh, moment there. Um, anyway, well, so we'll see how those, those, those flagship programs go. There was, a, there was a one that, would, that I'm uh, tangentially connected to that didn't make it, and it was, it was not ranked number one for a long time, and then something happened the last week. Uh, it's future ICT, it's called, but it was basically about all this data and people and things and economics and how do we you know, how do we make the world a better place and right so it always sounds it's always bad when someone starts saying about for the greater good you have to be a little careful right? it's always a giveaway in a movie when, when the bad guys patting their cats and they're on the swivel chairs start talking about the greater good you know you're in trouble but that's uh you know that that was I mean, it's, it's it's definitely the mission of science and, and that was the, the framing there. anyway didn't get it all right so you you no, fair enough. Right. But just to show you that people have gone way overboard with, with what data comes from. Um, 
But it has given it, it have, has given us this much bigger window than we have to look at these things, right? It'd be akin to saying, here's a giant telescope, you can look at the stars now, and saying, no, I like um, actually just thinking about them. <laughs> and, and some people could make some progress like that, but you know, there's a little bit of just look. Uh, all right, so the very simplest definitions for now. So, so nodes will be, so we'll have nodes and links, and we can call them vertices and edges if we're feeling a little more proper and correct, mathematically applied. Uh, so somehow they, these, these things have uh, connections with each other. And, and so it be very broadly construed. So of course people, that would be the forks and rivers, right? Uh, proteins, and so these are more ephemeral kinds of connections. They're not actually tied together. Uh, but electrical circuits are and so on. Uh, these things are web pages, so, so the web of course is lifted out completely on top of the internet. Um, turns out mapping the internet is really hard actually, so we still haven't kind of done that fantastically. You know, there's a lot of arguing about what the internet really is, uh, what you should class a route, you know, various types of routing and things and so on. Uh, so the links are going to be the connections and uh, very simply, they can be directed or undirected. There's a lot of work that's been done on undirected ones, right? So it's just a little link with no flavor, no strength to it. You have to figure that stuff out. And we'll probably stay in that realm for most of this, I, I think, for everything we do here. Uh, but these are the natural ways to move out. Maybe a little bit of directed, but binary or weighted. So of course, weighted makes a lot of sense. Of course, if you're in electrical networks and circuits, it's very easy to have. You have to talk about um, impedance and so on, so that's very natural there. If you talk about traffic systems, talk about the flow, the throughput, potential. Um, so it's, it's key, of course, to many, many, explaining many networks, I mean, the strength of a friendship, hard thing to measure, but the clue that it is something. We can at least talk about the idea of it, there must be a strength. Um, okay, spiffing words, vertices and edges. Um, so, uh, but as I said, we'll, we'll so you can get into some trouble by doing what we're doing, which is to say the nodes are all the same kind of size and the edges are all links. So if we have a map of the, uh, the web and we have Google as a little node, my web page is a little node, that's kind of set up. So, so, so we'll see where that can lead you. Um, very important thing is node degree. Right? So this is the number of links per node, number of edges per node. Um, and so K is what's generally taken in the literature to be the, this, uh, this quantity, so K sub I. Of course, we have no friends, one friends, two friends. Again, more complicated when there's a weight involved. You have to think about that. Uh, so we'll talk about the average degree of network. And um, you'll see Z, that often appears in the, in the uh, Z. You'll, you'll see that a lot in the uh, literature. It's, uh, it rhymes. It's good. Um, and uh, very simple thing. So if we have M edges in the network, it's really super basic. So we have these nodes and then edges. And so each edge has uh, two ends to it. Right? They're connecting two nodes. So if we have M edges, we have two M ends of edges in the network. So if we want to figure out the average degree, so it's 2m divided by the total number of nodes. Right, because there are 2m edges coming into nodes, uh, and then we'll have our average degree. Right. So that's a key thing. So you can imagine every possible network, and they're labeled, right? So there's node A, node B, node C. Or, um, imagine configuring them with m edges and all the possible ways you can do that, that's a, that's a very natural thing to do, and that's, that's the random network story. So we'll think about that. Uh, we'll think about what happens as you increase the average degree. Um, there's a, there's a, a funny property of networks in general, right? So you can imagine that uh, having all the connections in play would be great, because then everyone can communicate with everyone and so on, and that's, that's a pretty good thing. But it's very expensive to do that, evidently. And, and it's not just you know, in terms of weighing out connections, but it's... Um, it turns, out, it turns out for some kinds of like innovation, right, for example, that's actually a bad thing. It's bad to see everyone. We're talking about a social network at the same time. So it's a, it's a, it's a complicated story. Um, it's not just that you always increase in. There's a, 
and, and get you know, returns for that. Often sparse networks are good. And so you'll see this is a calligraphic N. It's a set of uh, the neighbors of, of uh, node I. Right? So you might want to do that at the top of it. So you can imagine lots of coding can go into this, right? There's a lot of programs that one can write with spreading things around on networks, creating networks that have a particular flavor to them. Really, just a spellbindingly large amount of work that's been done to do that. Um, often this is useful, adjacency metrics, and this can allow you to do some, some nice math, but this is again just talking about the basic things here. So this is uh, a little linear algebra action. Um, so we'll take well, adjacency metrics A. So uh, this is the link between I and J, right? the strength of the link. So let's see if we can make that one. So we can do it. So this would be, so you bring it across like this, right? So this is node one, and this is node one, two, three, four, across like this. So node one is connected to, so this, this is node one, it's connected to node two, and it's a directed edge, three and four. This is exciting for you. <laughs> and then um, node two is connected to node three, and node five. And then node one is, um, sorry, node three is connected back to node one. So this is, so we could make that if you want. We could make it undirected. Um, am I lying about these things? Node four is connected to node two, so it goes over there. And node five is connected to node two, so we'll make that this way. And then there's a, a one for four, so this. And so if you want weights, then it's simple. You just put some weights in here. This thing up and down. It's exactly what you do for an electrical network. You have your impedance matrix. Um, which is a bit of a messy thing, actually. Usually you want the uh, inverse like that. Right. Um, conductance. Okay, good. Uh, and of course, real complex networks are usually almost sparse. It's not always true, but they're by and large very sparse. Um, some regions of the brain might not be the case, but many, many real networks are sparse. Very few links relatively. So that's in here. So what part, so what, you know, when do we sort of say, we're, so it's a bit of a, bit of a mushy concept, um, but somehow they're large in node number. A large obviously being a bit of a funny thing, but they're large. I think from a practical point of view, when you're doing coding and simulating things, 10,000 is a good base number, right? 10,000 nodes. Usually, if you run things on 10,000 nodes, it usually means you're, you're, you're exploring the thing pretty well. It can be too low sometimes, but 10,000 nodes is kind of an idea. There's sparks, right? So this is low edge to, uh, to node ratio. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, a big piece. Um, you know, there's usually some, it's not always true, but there's usually some dynamic uh, evolution involved with it. We're not thinking about fixed graphs so much. We might model them like that, but we're thinking about real networks. Uh, and they can be a bit of everything. So I'll have some classifications here, right? Social, economic, natural, information, very abstract ones. All sorts of things. And it's very, very enjoyable to turn a lot of these problems into network situations. There's a piece that I think I will add to this course later on, which is about Okay, so you've got this massive network. Uh, how do you go about describing that? Right, so that's been an incredibly difficult problem. And it's been, the, the frame for it is community detection. Right? So the idea is, can you find, so here's this huge mess, and really you just have an adjacent team matrix, so it hands you that. Can you shuffle things around so that you find the nodes that are connected to each other, that they sort of form a good group? But they are also maybe part of a bigger group. Like can you see some modular structure to this thing? And so that's a that's been a huge game played out. Lots of different algorithms. You know, you talk about millions of nodes, ten millions of nodes, more. Um, really, really difficult problems. So how do you how do you, in some reasonable, you know, non-biased way, kind of extract the, the structure? So it often turns out that there's a hierarchical aspect to these networks as well. They're still Lots and lots of connections everywhere, but you can, if you rearrange things on a page properly, you can start to see, well, there's this big group here in this group. So we'll, we'll see some of that. All right, so 
this is an overview. So I'm, I'm going to give you three classes of, of networks, um, and and then we'll talk about a, a list of properties that, that are, you know, some are pretty straightforward, but they're properties that, that, that seem to be, have kind of come out of this work to, to seem to be quite useful. So it's not everything you can think about networks, and this is a bit of a, so this is a difficult thing. Which ones do we need to, to really measure about a network to be able to say, well, this one's going to break, or this one's going to allow spreading? Right? I mean, if you figure out what the, what, what's the interconnections between uh, companies or between financial systems, between banks, right? What, can you then say something about this, this system or say the airline networks? Right? Can we now say, by looking at that, it's a big jumble, right? It's going to be a big hairball of a thing. Can you do something pretty quickly to say, well, if there's a disease starts to spread in this thing, we're in a lot of trouble, right? I mean, what, can we get to some point? So that's been a, a battle. We've made some, generally, some very good advances. Um, you know, if you have software, right? You have software. You've built this huge thing. Is it robust in some way? Or are there some horrible things? And so there's a lot of work done there, too. Um, very kind of connected ideas. And how can you change it to make it more of us? Um, river networks, neural networks. So these are physical ones. There's a real physical link between real physical nodes. Of course, we're long, and we talked about the brain before. We're a long way from figuring these things out. Turns out leaves. We're still working on leaves. We're still trying to understand leaves. Really great problems surrounding leaves. Um, blood networks. Uh, angiogenesis. Right? Somehow the blood networks grow as we, and we're getting to understanding that. Um, trees, of course, is phyllotaxis, which is a beautiful story, right? That's about um, Fibonacci numbers and all sorts of things. That's a possible um, project, right? Um, the web. So this is some version of the web from way, way back, you know, but uh, very hard thing to visualize. Road networks, of course, power grids. So these are real physical things. And broadly for these physical kind of networks, there are two distinct ones. One's, one's a distribution where there's a branching. Right, so it could be collection or distribution where you, there's a central node or hub and, and things are spreading out from that. Um, you could think for a, a river network, of course, the heart distributing blood out. So we have, so in organisms you have the uh, distribution and collection system. Right? You have the arterial, which takes things out through the uh, capillaries or capillaries? Which one do you like? Capillaries. 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 I did have a student who would wince every time I said you could. Anyway, um, just, just physically, actually, I was in pain. <laughs> so, I don't want to hurt anyone. Um, so it goes out through the uh, capillaries or whatever I'm supposed to say, and then comes back through the veins, right? So they're separate. Well, there's two kinds of distribution networks. Of course, there's some redundancy in, in those networks. They're not pure branching ones, right? The circle of Willis, so you have blood coming up, and it goes into a little ring road, which if we're in Massachusetts, everything will crash. Go berserk, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, there are four, I think four arteries going up into that, and so there's some redundancy in your brain. So that fellow I mentioned at the very start of all of this, the Marikoff character, who was a brain surgeon, much to my amazement, um, he, he said he operated once on a patient that um, only had one of those arteries working. You know, so it was okay, but really down to the last, uh, the last piece. Um, <coughs> Circle of Willis, you know, right. who was some mad person who had an ego a long time ago or something. So discovered things about the brain that he probably shouldn't have been looking at. Okay, so um, the blogosphere, this is from uh, from a long time ago. There's, there's some really, there's some other pictures I could find for that one. But they, yeah, but basically these are blogs being connected to each other. Uh, of course, that sphere has kind of passed away a little bit. It's uh, died down. Um, will be trimmed, I suppose, with Facebook and Twitter taking over. Uh, so these are more, so these are what I would call interaction networks. The other ones are real physical ones, you can see them, right? They're manifested in two or three dimensions. Uh, so these are uh, ephemeral, or they have interactions that, that pass away. So we have biochemical networks, gene-protein networks, protein-protein, gene-gene, all of those guys. Um, food webs, who eats who? Right. So that's a, so this is an interesting problem where you know, maybe, do we get to a point where we can remote sense the food, the food network, right? The food web, or the food web of a particularly large region. So we have graduate students go out, count who eats whom, hopefully do not get involved in the food web themselves. Um, 
where graduate students are expendable. Of course, we all know that. So, um, uh, so we have that, and then uh, you know, and there are some clever things about trying to look at how things trace through organisms. Right? So you might have some chemical something that traces through. Uh, so you might be able to say something about, well, this was eaten by this and this and this. So you might maybe get it, but it's. I mean, it's hard to maybe, maybe we figure it all out. It's just hard to conceive of a little bit. So um, you know, if you go back before satellites, it's, it's sort of insane to think that we could uh, take pictures of. Of, of the world, right, and figure out what the structure is, right, and have, have maps. You know, and that's it's pretty nuts. It's, pretty, it's very hard, maybe, you know, 1880, unless you're sort of an insane science fiction person, to think of, I mean, before cameras, right? I mean, how would we, how would you, you know, make it up in your head? But the fact that we can do that, we can image that in a remote sensing way, is pretty amazing. Uh, so you want to think about that. Where, you know, where is the field going? How, where is it right now? Is it kind of a wild west? Um, the World Wide Web. Um, the web. So uh, there's a question mark for that one. But it does induce their interactions. And some are sort of passive. And there's a lot of, of course, uh, algorithms floating around doing lots of things more and more. Airline networks. I mean, I'm going to call them interaction networks because they're really isn't a physical thing. Right? They're movable, changeable. There's some sort of could describe it as this is sort of probably of a plane going from here to there. Um, <clears throat> all the call networks, AT&T famously stayed there for a long time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I don't really understand this, but th that data has been around for a long time, so I'm not quite sure why that didn't. It was closed. I mean, you couldn't get it, but it, that was sitting there. I mean, people had this, and maybe it was the you know computing power wasn't strong enough. We were not seeing the patterns. Media in general, right? So the media is a it's hard to map this out, but the way stories pass around, really interesting thing. And a very hard thing to see is some big character in the media has a story, and often it's percolated up. If you know anything about it, it's percolated up from a small scale, perhaps, and, and that's hard to see. You can see where it goes after it hits the, the big hub, but um, it can be hard to get those small things. So this is more interaction networks with social, the social story, so snogging, um, <laughs> which just means kissing. And, um, uh, <coughs> So the ridiculous college that I went to in Australia, so it was this Trinity College, so there's a situation of there's Melbourne Uni and then there's Crescent of Colleges, so it's pretending to be like England, right? So you have your, you have dinner in your gown, in your, in your academic gowns, and there's a sort of grace in Latin, there's a high table, the whole business, there are carving lessons because someone brings a roast to the end of all these um, oak tables, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but now every, once a year, there'd be a secretive group that would put up the snog map for the for the for the year, and it would be displayed on the big doors to the uh, dining room, and it would have a picture kind of like this, of course, with names, right? With names. So, um, you can't see this. I don't know what that number is, but there's a whole bunch of little pairs here. So these are the ones where. So this is from a high school, and it's a study by Peter Bamman, who was in charge of the uh, group of Columbia of the uh, Institute for Social and Economic Research. Um, policy at Columbia, I was part of for a while. And so here's a couple of colleagues here. Uh, yeah, so this is on self-report, I guess, right? But this is accumulated network, which is an important thing to think about. It's over, I think, a six month period, something like that. And so, yeah, you have all of your, so this blue thing. Um, you, so if you look at, so again, you know, you look at this and you think, wow, this is a great place to spread, you know, diseases, right? Right? But it's accumulated. So you need to see how this thing evolved in time. And we, this has happened a lot where you collapse these interaction networks down um, and so you get a beautiful picture, but potentially. Um, but it, it loses the, uh, the dynamics, right? So it may not be that that is actually a very strong spreading thing. And of course these smaller ones, there's some sequencing here that, that's lost. Um, but this, you know, it's, it's, a, way, it's a way to, uh, it, it was an interesting study. Okay, so well done there. Um, <laughs> self report uh, So, uh, acquaintances, obviously, boards and directors are a very interesting thing. Um, there was a website years ago called theyrule.now, which I think is probably still there. But it was a nice interactive thing where you could click on the board of Pepsi or something and see, so all the people's names would pop up, and then you could click on one of them and see which other boards they're on. So you could kind of see how this works. So this gives you this, this is an example of, uh, we'll, we'll talk about these bipartite, bi Apartheid affiliation graphs. Right? So you'll have 
So in this case, you have boards, you, you lay out your boards in one big line like this, right? So there's Pepsi and Coke and so on. And then you have individuals here, and then you have all the links between them, uh, between the boards. And, and then that manifests a connection, a, a network. You can then lift out of that and you get a network of the people. You also get a network of the boards, right? This board is connected to this board because they share and there's some weight. It really sounds like someone's screaming. Yeah. <laughs> and we probably should do something about that, but we'll pretend it's um, gas. Yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, dear. Okay, well, must be okay if I stop, right? But, okay, we'll talk about Milgram later on. <laughs> very uh, much the story there. Uh, so, so this is a really, you know, very rich thing. Uh, you can imagine. So we had the actors in movies story as well, but it's the same thing. So where you have uh, venues or um, ways that people interact, context, and so for people, right, it could be sporting teams, it could be classrooms, it could be um, you know, religious venues, right, so you have these ways of, of connecting together. So it, it, it's a much, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of the right way to view many social um, networks. Right? We tend to want to have a, just a network where we just have people connected to each other, but it's much more useful often to think of uh, the context in which they interact and keep that on the page, right? Context of people, so we don't collapse the whole thing. When I first started doing this, I had MySpace written here. <laughs> <laughs> MySpace? I mean, does, does anyone ever still use MySpace? Bands use it, right? No? Does anyone ever accidentally go to MySpace? No. <laughs> Justin Timberlake it's, bought it. It's for music. It was originally it is, supposed right, to be music. Right. It still is a little bit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. People use Bandcamp and stuff. Okay, so there's something. Yeah. It sounds like a bad place to go now. If you have your band. Okay. Who bought it? Hmm? Who bought the thing? Justin Timberlake bought it. Oh, I thought Murdoch owned it. No? Uh, they were selling it because it's so useless. And Timberlake bought it? I think so, yeah. Maybe it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's sort of a. Okay, maybe, maybe, yeah. Wow, doesn't seem like a good investment. Anyway, just to be, just to be honest, they used to, and, and I suppose if I'd done this a few years before, I would have had Friendster. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 few, maybe, yeah, Friendster. But Friendster was the big deal, right? Early on, it was you know, way, way before Facebook. It just uh, died horribly. Um, not that I in any way like Facebook. Anyway, so. Um, so, but this is this remote sensing we can get at these social networks a little bit now, right? Not completely, of course, but uh, email activity is, is hard. Companies obviously do it within companies. Uh, we have some that have been revealed to the world, like uh, the Enron data set is something that people have enjoyed looking through, uh, because that's just been pumped out. To, you, can, you can just you get all these emails. It's, it's uh, you know, public, uh, public domain. Uh, you know, Instant messaging, so you see uh, companies like uh, you know, Microsoft and Yahoo, they have research groups within them that, that do a lot with these pieces. Um, phone logs, yeah, that's nice. Um, anyway, so there's open and closed, and uh, open is pretty enormous, and that's why everyone likes Twitter. Get it. Not easy to deal with. Right? All right, so that's, uh, if you want to look at that a little more, you can. Yeah, six months. Yeah, and there's 63. So 63. So see, it doesn't quite show this, but there are 63 little pairs down. You think this is a big story? Yeah. Okay, Jefferson High School. I believe it was somewhere in the Midwest. All right, so that's two types: uh, relational networks. Someone mentioned as well. So we've, we've uh, got Walmart. This, this number, number must be well. I wonder what Walmart's up to. I, need, I just should put a day on it. So we've, we've, we've had the uh, uh, Pop Tart story, which I read about like in comics when I was a kid. Just what are these things? I don't know what these, and Twinkies were the same way. What a Twinkie! So when I first came to the US, a friend of mine came to Harvard at the same time. So we made a little expedition to a uh, to a supermarket to find Twinkies. <laughs> and we kind of marvelled at them. We did not buy them, but we just looked at them. Um, looked at them a little bit. Yeah, it was like O.J. Simpson would be advertising Twinkies or something in a Superman comic. I don't really understand anything in this comic. <laughs> uh, right. um, next to the x-ray sunglasses. All right, so uh, 
these are these are what I call relational ones, uh, and some of them have, you know, some of them have real meaning, of course, in, in terms of what happens in the real world. Walmart, for example. Um, so it's a bit of a fuzzy thing. But for sorry, so you can you can look at uh, words that are adjacent to each other in terms of meaning. Um, of course, knowledge and done it. So it's not really a we have this old old thing, for a tree of knowledge, right? The tree of knowledge is kind of a nice nice story. Um, it's really a network of knowledge, and so you see that much more. Oh my god, there's a squirrel up there. Okay, so. It's such a terrible sound. Okay, that one's gone too. Alright. Um, uh, okay. So let's see. So, um, yeah, it's more of a, a, a network of knowledge. There are certainly tree type structures here and there where things are ordered. And, Strong, but there's a, uh, a very distributed kind of structure to it. Um, delicious still exists. Flick out a tagging, right? So this is a big deal, right? We, we started to do this for ourselves and became very useful for something like Flickr. Google image search is pretty good now, but Flickr for a long time was fantastic, right? Because you put in red apple and you could get a red apple. Google would sort of like look at the names of things. Um, make a bit of a mess of it, but they've, they've greatly improved. I'm, I'm not sure how they do it, but they've improved things. But this was based on the people, right? So socio-technical uh, phenomenon, right? Yeah, the, the technical stuff is enormous in terms of getting all those pictures together. You should find that. Uh, maybe you've seen it, so I'll show it next time perhaps, but there's a uh, great bit of work. It's now owned by Microsoft, which could mean bad things, but um, uh, it's a uh, What's the name of it? Um, this guy Blaze. Where you put, uh, so you, you go through all these photos from Flickr. Right? People have uploaded stuff and sometimes they put geodata. Then you can just start sticking them together. So you can actually create 3D uh, uh, representations of, quite good 3D representations of places where people take a lot of photos in particular. And here's a beautiful example of uh, Notre Dame, for example. Right? Anyway, but the, the crazy thing is, right, this, the, the, tagging, the tagging allows you to really quickly get into that. Uh, and it's a huge departure from, so this is for Wikipedia, this is a little cloud. Word cloud for, for Wikipedia, it's a huge departure from, no, it's the bottom up story. So if you go back and look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, very interesting debates were held uh, about that kind of knowledge. Like, how do you store knowledge, right? So we have the Dewey Decimal System, for example. Uh, if you look at, there are two parts of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The first one is A, B, C, D. And so some people thought this was anathema, especially dictionaries. I and mean, why would you list things alphabetically? Because it is sort of, sort of not completely, but it, there's a real randomness to that. And it's not structured as people would invoke God, for example. This is just not right. You shouldn't have a, um, I don't know, a, a, um, you could, you could think of anything, like aardvark next to airplane. That doesn't, it's just ridiculous. Like they're just, they have no, it's, it's just not meaningful, right? So that, that was the, the objections. And so there's a second part to the Encyclopedia of Britannica, which is structure. It's an attempt to break knowledge into pieces. But of course it has to fit into three dimensions, right? It has to be on a bookshelf. So in a sense it has to be linear. And it has to fit that way, and that's crazy. I mean, knowledge is outside of three dimensions. But there, we really have to have it on the line. We need to have it fit on shelves. So we had to do a very crazy thing and take this massively high dimensional space of knowledge and put it into, I don't know. It's, it's funny if you go, if you spend a lot of time using something like Amazon to you know, search around, which might not be perfect for everyone, but it's pretty good at that. You know, suggesting other books, for example. Um, so the adjacent space is not not just what's on the shelf in front of you. And if you go into a bookstore, which you should, but if you go into one um, and look, you find a book, then you're, you, you, see, you, feel, you feel bereft of information. You know, why are these books next to it? You know, there's, some of them make sense, but um, I'd like to see this book and this book and this book. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it'd be good to have both of those things married together. I guess you can do that with sneaky little uh, um, barcode things, but okay. Uh, this this is hard to this is hard to see. This is uh, Boland's work, um, looking at how people click around through science, and it's hard for me to uh, read this. Thing, which is a shame, but uh, 
it's worth looking at, I'll, I'll give you the link, but so there's archaeology and psychology over here, for example, and then out here you have so this biochemistry and chemistry and physical chemistry. You see you know, kind of where these things are adjacent to each other. This is a... The chemists don't read anything else that anyone else reads. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, you can see who's, who's off by themselves. So social, social work, which is kind of sad for social to be on the edge, but um, that seems to be there. I think that's geography in there. So this is a kind of fun thing to look around and um, see what's kind of core to everything and what's... And then, of course, this is where science is right now. Economics is up here. This is published in science? So. Uh, this was PLOS 1. Okay. Which does terrible things to graphics. Puts them into TIFFs. That's horrible. So this should be a nice zoomable picture. <laughs> and I should, I should see if I can find that from the image. It was just a nice picture. And there are millions and millions of figures and graphs around it. I can point you to one, but um, uh, often they're like this, and I'll finish with this. Often this is the problem. And, well, this is not sure. Um, we 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 go out of our way to make some beautiful pictures, um, but this is this is often the case, right? So this is just a randomly selected network. It's got 500 nodes, so it's not very big. Thousand edges. And we had that little formula before, so 1,000 edges, that means there are 2,000 ends to those edges, so 2,000 divided by 500, so the average root is 4. So on average, these nodes only have 4 frames. Right. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, maybe 10 frames would be sort of the most in here. Um, but it's a mess. It's a horrible mess. And there are ways of trying to you know, tease it apart and so on. Um, wow, well, there's a silly, silly comment. Right, so even if you make them look good, it's a very graphic analogy which aids understanding wonderfully while being strictly speaking wrong in every possible way. So, so this happens quite a bit. You know, you end up with a beautiful thing. You're like, oh, that's really good. That helps me, but it doesn't. Right, so, so you can get tricked. Right? So often we we reduce, we step away from this. We we can't help ourselves. There are better. There are, there are certainly beautiful programs now that, that um, do a better job than than they have in the past. But we need to. Often, just pull out things that are, uh, um, you know, say, for example, the one I'll talk about, which is the main example, is degree distribution. Right? What's the distribution of the number of frames? Right? So that's going to be just a, uh, that's a plot. It's not going to be anything like this. And so that's going to be the um, the next section, and I'll talk about this on Thursday. But just to say, degree distribution. There's these things of sortativity. This is how homophily, so a birds of a feather type stories. Clustering, do your friends know each other? Motifs, are there small parts in the network that have kind of repeated structures? Modularity, I talked about before, that's that there's groups and groups of groups and groups of groups. Uh, concurrency, this is to do with the snogging story, right? You need to know how this network is unfolding dynamically. Uh, hierarchical scaling could do with uh, modularity as well, but also uh, branching networks. Um, distances between nodes and sometimes edges. Uh, these, you know, how well the thing works, given what it's supposed to do, how, how well it holds together. These are you know, some of the really main ones. I will say that this is kind of the, the highlight story, right? These are sort of secondary to this. This is the big story for it. Um, which everyone missed until 99, right? Everyone missed that completely. Everyone just absolutely missed that story, that this thing matters. It just was not in people's heads. Um, even though you can go back and see that you know, we were talking about it in some parts. Uh, and of course, this how these things come evolve, right? So that's really that's really hard. Right? So we have processes acting on networks, we have the structure of the network, these things are going back and forth potentially. Um, even just a network evolving by itself is a very difficult, interesting problem to think about. But then when you have stuff running on top of them, right? So contagion spreading, which may break the network up, um, financial transactions, then you get a whole different business. So that is where we should stop. And uh, so yeah, some more notebooks over the next few weeks. And I'll give you some more stuff for projects so you can uh, choose some things to work on. Okay. Okay. Office hours tomorrow, normal thing. One to four. Are we still going to be talking about our projects next week? Not next week because that would be bad. Yeah. Right? Do you guys agree? I mean, is that okay to have it put up? Uh, <laughs> yeah? You're supposed to say yes. Yeah. I can't remember. Well, we can talk about our questions. Yeah, so I need to. Today, I can't, like, work on that because I do have to go. I've only, like, Yeah, so I want you guys. I'll, I'll send out another 
the list of possible projects as well. Like I know I'm going to update that a little. Some of you have chosen things, but then I want you to send me uh, what you would like to work on. And the first presentation is three minutes long, and you just say what the problem is. So, but you. Have, uh, what I would like to see is not examples of projects, but like requirements for the projects, so I can like come up with my own projects. Um, so the suggestions, yeah, yeah, for, 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 for projects. They're not just examples of ones that have been done. These are suggestions for things to really work on. Like that's what that list is. It's, so people will take those ones. Um, yeah, no, I, what I really want is, so this is this range of possibilities, right? So you can, you can work on something where you, you get a paper that exists, or some body of work, and you figure that out. And that's the, that's the end result. So this is, it can be hard to work for something. Like um, all the way up to, I'm gonna you know, try and write a paper about something. Okay. Well, I'm gonna start off some research. Right. We can talk to you. Uh, Dylan, are you going to...